American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at QueenCityPodcastNetwork.com. So now I'm obsessed with time. Come on, tell me about the time. Had it all in my head tonight. Had the time of my life. When the words all come down, like blues on Tuesdays come down. Throw it all away. Throw it all away. Welcome to another episode of American, American Timelines. Time I'm Amy and that's Joe. Yes, that's who we are. And we are History for Jerks, a married couple who love history. All right. And, and today, also murders. we are going to talk about 1969. Yep, we're in the 69s. We're almost done with this season. And if you can't tell, we're sort of mailing it in at this point. Yeah. It's uh, hard to care about much. It's hard to care about things in this it's hard to care about a podcast, I yeah. guess is what I should say. I think when this first pan- when this pandemic hit at first, I was like, oh, I'll just stay home and make a bunch of podcasts and this will be great and we'll do it. But it's hard to even do anything at yeah, this point. It is. It's hard to get out of bed. It's hard to like, what's the point of combing my hair? Combing your pubes. Why should I comb my pubes today? You know, you I shouldn't. You shouldn't. And the other days I comb them because in case somebody sees them. Just in them. case. Now it's like I have no reason to comb my pubes. All right. I guess to get the lice out of them. All right. You're <laughs> going way over the, the hey, top Hey, I now. talk for reals. Anyway, April 1st, 1969 is where we left off. April Fool's Day. April Fool's Day. It was a Thursday of 1969. Uh, and that was the day the original space shuttle was designed. Did you know that? Oh, okay. I think. You- that was it was released. No, I have a let's see. Uh at Houston in Houston, NASA engineer Max F- I gotta say this right without offending anyone. Max Faggot. Oh jeez. <laughs> Faggot. Max Fag Faget. F A G E T. Faget. Faget. Maybe. Max Faget showed twenty colleagues a small balsa wood and paper model. With straight stubby wings and a shark-like nose and told them, we're going to build America's next spacecraft. It's going to launch like a spacecraft. It's going to land like a plane. Faget, the director of engineering and... All right. Faget, the director of engineering and development at the Manned Space Center, was introducing the assembled group to a planned reasonable spacecraft called the American Space Shuttle. Well, there we go. And then there we go. Because rocket ships didn't look like space shuttles before that. No, before that, they looked like just looked yeah, like like dildos. dildos. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> what you said. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then. Uh, what else? Meeting in Stevenson, Washington that same day, the Board of County Commissioners of. Here we go again. Skamania County. Mm-hmm. Skamania County voted to enact County Ordinance Number sixty nine sixty nine dude dash o one, making either an April Fool's Day joke, or the first official recognition by any government agency of the possibility of the existence of Bigfoot. Whether intended as humorous or not, the ordinance was published in the April fourth and April eleventh issues of the weekly Skamania County Pioneer, a requirement under state law, and was amended again in 1984. The text of the 1969 enactment noted evidence to indicate the possible existence in the county of an ape-like creature, a large number of purported recent sightings, and an influx of scientific investigators, as well as casual hunters, many armed with lethal weapons, and was passed to discourage laxity in the use of firearms that posed a threat to persons living or traveling with the boundaries of, within the boundaries of Skamania County and made slaying of the creature described as Sasquatch, Yeti, or Bigfoot a felony punishable by a $10,000 fine and or five years imprisonment. So it was a, a joke? They don't know. Nobody Uh-oh. knows it was a joke or Well, real. it wasn't on April Fool's Day. It was on April 4th, you said. No, April 1st, but it was printed. Because oh. the rule is you have to print anything that becomes an ordinance. Mm-hmm. And so they printed it on April 4th and April 11th. Oh, okay. I don't know if that... But that must be a place where they, a lot of sightings. Yeah, maybe. 
I don't know. Now that we have Google Earth, yeah, I don't know if I believe so much in book Bigfoot anymore because we have taken images of pretty much every inch of the Earth, except for but Antarctica. Google Earth. It's not like it's a live picture. Like when you look at it, it's a but snapshot. But don't you think? Don't you think somebody would have seen something at some point? Has anybody looked at every single Google Earth image? No, I don't know. I'm not sure how that exactly works, but yeah, I think. At this point, I feel like we've seen so many things. We've seen everything. We would have found it by now. But on the other hand, I keep hearing there's still tribes of people that have been mm-hmm. undiscovered that people oh, really? find every once in a while. They're like mad and they shoot arrows at airplanes because they think it's like a demon. Yeah. Huh. So how is that possible? Yeah, I know. It's a, it's, it, you'd think it's a small world, but I guess maybe not. Is it a small world? I don't know. Mm-hmm. Does anybody know? Call in. If you if you're listening right now and you think either it is a small world or it's not, call one nine hundred hot tits <laughs> and, and, tell and then just tell them, <laughs> and they'll relay it back to us somehow. Yep, yep. Uh, uh, <laughs> on April third, nineteen sixty nine, which was a Thursday, mm-hmm. Canadian professional wrestler Lance Storm was born as Lance Evers. It wasn't Lance his. Given name was not Lance Storm, just so you know. Oh, God. And then on Friday, April 4th, 1969, Dr. Denton Cooley implanted the first temporary artificial heart in an operation at St. Luke's Episcopal Hospital in Houston. It's crazy. Or as some people pronounce it, Houston. You think they'll ever have an artificial brain? Oh, they already do. It's in you. Boom. Burn. It's in my wife. Bam. All right. That doesn't no. even make sense. I was just trying to burn you because you're not that smart, but you're actually way smarter than me. So it, I think I don't think they could, though. Could do you? I don't think. Well, because that's where you're. Yeah, I'll tell you that's this. what makes you you. Right. Is it your brain or is it your soul? Well, but if it's no, I think it's your brain. <laughs> I'll tell you this much. If they do. Yeah. We'll never know Why? because we will be. The people with artificial brains controlled by some kind of government. Maybe we all have artificial brains. We might be artificial people. Could be. There, have you ever heard of the movie The Mandela Effect? Yeah. There's a movie about that where it's like, it's all just a simulation. It's like a movie about being in a simulation. I want to watch it because I, I think I'm convinced now more than ever we're living in a simulation. I don't know. I just don't know. Anyway, I got more about that. I think we're Artificial on the heart. Oregon Trail, and somebody made a bad, got a bad score or something. On the Oregon Trail, and it like this pandemic flash forwarded to 2020. Well, it's like a pandemic, just like that. Oh, cholera and mm-hmm. all that. Dysentery. Dysentery. That's right. Anyway, the recipient of this heart was a 47 year old named Haskell Carp of Skokie, Illinois, whose diseased heart was removed from his chest and replaced by the Lyota. T-A-H, Plastic and Fabric Mechanical Pump. Wow. Developed by Dr. Domingo Liotta. 65 hours after the implement, implementation implantation of the mechanical heart, Carp received a donor heart from a 40-year-old woman whose body had been flown in from Lawrence, Massachusetts. Oh. Uh, however, Carp survived only 32 hours after the new heart was implanted before he succumbed to pneumonia caused by bacteria. Mm-hmm. Another artificial heart implant would not take place until 1981. Wow, so they stopped that shit. Yeah, they waited for MTV to be invented. They said, nope, can't do it right now. Yeah, we're going to figure that out. That same day, popular but controversial, the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour was abruptly canceled by the CBS Television Network. CBS President Robert Wood explained that the show's two producers, Dick Smothers and Tommy Smothers, consistently had failed to deliver tapes of their programs in time for CBS executives and local TV stations to review the content, and added that it was abundantly clear that the brothers were unwilling to accept the criteria of taste established by the network's program practices department. I think they were wrote, they were like... Real progressive. Yeah, I think they and were I pretty think, political. And I, yeah, yeah, and I think they that's really why they... Nixon didn't like it. Mm-hmm. Uh, that same day, also on April 4th, 
The popular and controversial singer Jim Morrison of the Doors appeared with its attorney before the Los Angeles office of the FBI to answer federal charges of interstate flight to avoid prosecution in relation to its indecent exposure at its March 1st concert in Miami. By arrangement, Morrison was arrested and immediately released upon posting of a $5,000 bond. By then, the Doors' 1969 concert dates had been canceled and the group was blacklisted by the Concert Hall Managers Association. Mm. You ever hear of that? That's C-H-M-A? Nope. I can't believe you. You call yourself a researcher on management associations. Jeez. Pfft. Yep. Jesus. April 5th, 1969 was a Saturday. Okay. A sniper killed two people at random and wounded 15 more on a section of the Pennsylvania Turnpike Whoa. as he pulled off to the shoulder of the westbound lanes and fired at passing cars with an army carbine and a 30 caliber rifle after killing a man and a woman near the high spire service area donald lambright the son of comedian stefan stefan fetch it oh killed his wife and then himself boom yeah wow Isn't that crazy mm-hmm. and then sunday april 6 1969 dude uh paul rudd was born american film actor known for portraying Ant-Man, and he's also in Clueless, the greatest movie of all time. Okay. You like Paul Rudd? Yeah, You find him cute? That. You find him attractive? Uh, he's all right. Doesn't really do it for you? He's not my type. He's not your type? Yeah. A lot of people say I'm exactly like Paul Rudd. I'm no. a Paul Rudd type. Nobody says that. I'm a Paul Rudd type to a lot of people. Nobody. No? Mm-mm. You think I'm more of a Waylon Jennings type? If this With that beard? Yeah. Yeah. I have a COVID beard. I know. It's I get it stuck in my quite zipper. Quite obnoxious. I like it. I think I look like like a Greek god. Kenny Loggins. <laughs> or Kenny Loggins. I either look I look like a mix between <laughs> a Greek god and Kenny Loggins. You're getting those easy tops pretty soon. Yeah. A lot of chicks dig that. Nobody does. No, some chicks do. Nobody does. I'll find a lady who does and she'll be a Old, haggard yes, lady will. that she'll won't be, be attractive, a, but she'll like my beard. She'll be a clan wife. Oh, no, don't say that. Monday, April 7th, 1969. Yes. I understand you have something for us on that date, right? I'm one of many things that's kind of peppered throughout. Well, April um, 7th, 1969 is the same day that the UCLA grad student and computer scientist Steve Crocker wrote and circulated the very first Request for Comments publication to be circulated among the network Working group. What? Why are we talking about Jeff that? Jeff Ruffelson and Bill Duvall of Stanford Research Institute and Steve Carr of Utah that was developing the communication protocols of the upcoming ARPANET, the forerunner of the internet. Oh, okay. So, so the summer of 1969, I know we're not there yet. Yeah. But it's pretty bananas. Yeah, the summer is crazy. So, so, so what you're telling me is you have lots of stuff to cover in that summer of 1969. In order to spread it out. Spread it, baby. Um, spread it, you hot lady. All right. Sorry. In order to do that, spread I am going to milk. stop. Sorry. I'm going to um, have... Su- I'm going to talk about something that happens in the summer, but there's a precursor event that happens in April. Okay, because... And this is only because you have several other things to cover in the summer, summer. right? Yes. So just so you all know, 1969 is the culmination of American Timelines Season 4. And it also is a culmination. It was a crazy effing year for murders. Mm -hmm. And this is a true crime podcast. This is going to be, yeah, it's not a, well, there's some murder involved. But this is going to be um, the story of the Stonewall Uprising. Oh, the Stonewall Uprising. Uprising. The Stonewall Riots. The Stonewall Riots, which some people might be unfamiliar with. Yes. So you're going to just dive in or you're going to give so us an overview? I got my uh, information from uh, processhistory.org. Processhistory.org reference. Uh, history.com. History.com and reference. And Wikipedia. Wikipedia can be edited by anyone. All right. <laughs> so, <laughs> so the 1960s and yeah. previous preceding decades. Yep. Was were the 50s and the 40s and the 30s. Were not a welcome time for LGBT Americans. Yes. It was not okay to be gay back then, so, unfortunately. So, for instance, um, in New York City, um, solicitation of same-sex relations was illegal, actually. Oh. 
Jeez. So for such That's reasons, terrible. LGBT individuals flocked to gay bars and clubs, which were places of refuge where they could express themselves openly and socialize without worry. And if you really think about it, they're lucky to have that. Well, the New York State Liquor Authority penalized and shut down establishments that penal. served alcohol to known or suspected LGBT individuals. Are you kidding? The Arguing what? that the mere gathering of homosexuals was, quote, disorderly, unquote. Here's my question about homophobia in general. Um, they say most homophobic, maybe not most homophobic, a lot of homophobics are actually gay themselves. Yeah. So do you think all these people in charge that were suppressing this were all just gay? No, I think it's, it comes from fear. Oh, fear of the unknown. Yeah. Because some people end up not being homophobic once they meet gay people and right. they see that they're normal people. Right, right. Huh. I don't know. It just fascinates me. Hatred, like hatred of I others know. fascinates me. Like, I, where does it, it's so fear based. So weird. It's all fear based. So thanks to activist efforts, yeah. these regulations were overturned in 1966 and LGBT patrons could now be served alcohol. Good. But progress. Engaging in gay behavior in public, which includes holding hands, kissing or dancing with someone of the same sex, was still illegal. That's it. They can't do those things, but they can full on do it. No. Oh. That would be called gay behavior, too. Oh. So police harassment yeah. of gay bars continued, Jeez. and many bars still operated without liquor licenses, and that was mostly because they were owned by the mafia. Whoa, really? Yep. Okay, yeah. So the that would be the case. So if we go back a yep. little bit, the first documented U.S. gay rights organization was called the Soci Society for Human Rights. Okay. That was founded in 1924. Really? 1924? Was it a gay organization by in the Henry, 20s? Yeah, by Henry Gerber, a German immigrant. Wow, the same guy that did the Gerber baby food. Police raids forced them to disband in 1925, which is only one year. But oh, not 1925, the same day that on different strokes. Stop it. But Sorry. not before they had published several issues of their newsletter, Friendship and Freedom, the country's first gay interest newsletter. In the 20s? Yes. Holy shit. They were, it was only one year before they yeah. were shut down. But still, I had no idea there was any sort of... Then Ameri gay anything in the 20s. America's first lesbian rights organization, the Daughters of... Bilitis, I think it's how you, I don't know. How do you spell it? B-I-L-I-T-I-S. B-I-L-I-T-S, okay. B -I -L. Was formed in San Francisco on September 21st, 1955. Wow, September 21st, 1955. The same day that Rocky Marciano KOs Archie Moore in nine rounds for the heavyweight boxing title? So in 1966, three years before Stonewall... Members of the Mattachine Society, an organization dedicated to gay rights. The Mattachine? Mm -hmm, staged a sip-in where they openly declared their sexuality at taverns, daring the staff to turn away and suing establishments who did. When the Commission on Human Rights ruled that gay individuals had the right to be served in bars, police raids were temporarily reduced so when they did that. Okay, so the... Okay. Then in 1969... Um, 69, dude. The raids continued. They went back. They kind of went they back. Went back more up. More bold and forgot. Yeah. Yep. <clears throat> and um, so, um, the, hold on, sorry. Hold on to my hat. Hold on to your tuchus. Hold on to your friggin' tuchus. I'm already fascinated about this. That I had no idea so, that there were any organizations in the 20s. That blows my mind. So, and the, anytime people talk about the Stonewall riots, um, they. Talk about the police raid that triggered the uprising. Right. But they rarely reference the wave of violence against LGBT people in the months leading up to the rebellion. Which started the rebellion. Yeah, which is why they were doing it. Yeah, okay. Reports of anti-queer police violence in particular spread via major urban newspapers. Some of these accounts suggested that police forces around the country felt newly emboldened by the inauguration of President Richard Nixon in January 1969. Same kind of stuff with Trump. Same kind of stuff. The self-proclaimed leader of the silent majority had campaigned on, quote, law and order. Right. Same rhetoric we hear now. Order, yeah, same thing from And Trump. a promise to crush the radicalizing political movements that threatened the existing social order. That could yeah. be written today. Yeah, it's... <sighs> that could be written right now. But it doesn't make any sense. Like, what is the fear? So like, LG you're afraid of a bunch of gay, gay people? Like, Well, and LGBT the people... Best. And people perceived to be queer suffered greatly in their this context. Yeah. So on March 9th, for example. Of 1969? Yes. Yeah, we already covered March. Uh, yep. You go Los back Angeles to last episode to find out what happened on March 9th. <laughs> <Yep. laughs> I'm not scrolling. Los Angeles police attacked and killed Howard Eflin, a 37-year-old nurse, also known as Jack McCann, 
during an anti-gay vi- vice raid on the Dover Hotel, which was popular with gay men. Multiple eyewitnesses risked public exposure and state retribution by courageously testifying about the police brutality that took Eflin's life. Good but, for a, them. but a local jury ruled that in April that the killing was an excusable homicide because according to the police, the victim had resisted arrest. Yeah, right. Then on April 3rd. That's bullshit. April 3rd, we 1969. We just talked about that a little bit ago. That was the one that I, I said was the day that... Uh, Lance Storm, the mm-hmm. wrestler, the Canadian wrestler, was born. New York police discovered the body of a man, estimated to be 20 to 25 years of age, who apparently had been strangled to death in March. His corpse was found in the Hudson River near the Christopher Street docks, a popular gay cruising spot not far from the Stonewall Inn. So you're saying this guy could have been reincarnated as Lance Storm? No, I didn't say that. That's weird. Then on Hinting. April 17th. The same day that Sirhan Sirhan was mm-hmm. convicted of first degree murder of U.S. Senator Robert Kennedy. Mm -hmm. And the same day that the television pilot for Medical Center, a popular CBS medical drama that would run for seven seasons, was shown as UMC, a made-for-TV movie starring film tough guy Edward G. Robinson? Yes. That same day? On that day, an an undercover police officer in Berkeley shot 33-year-old Frank Bartley, a local chef, when he tried to flee Aquatic Park, a well-known cruising area where the officer had engaged in the common police practice of sexual entrapment. Uh, Bartley died five days later. So that cop was trying to get yes. somebody to... Local authorities declined to pursue charges against the killer or his partner. On June 21st... June 21st, 1969 was a Saturday, mm-hmm. the same day that Royal Family, a candid documentary about the home life of Queen Elizabeth II, her husband and her four children, was broadcast for the first time and proved to be one of the most highly watched programs in the UK that same day? Yes. Vice Squad officers in Oakland, California, attacked Philip Kaplan, a professor visiting family in the area, after they accused him of loitering and lewd behavior in a public toilet near Lake Merritt. Kaplan, a married father who was on medication for prostate problems and sometimes needed to urinate frequently, died several days later. Oh, geez. Local authorities again declined to pursue charges against the police. The death of Kaplan, presumptively straight, exemplified the ways in which all people could be vulnerable to anti-queer violence. So we don't know whether the Stonewall rioters knew about all these incidents, but po- yeah. politically organized LGBT people in New York, yeah. some of whom participated in the rebellion, were definitely concerned about police violence. Yeah, I mean, it was, even if they didn't know about all this, like yeah. today, you hear about everything because yeah. of YouTube and everything, but they had to hear about it later, but still it was all going on. Mm-hmm. And who cares if the guy was straight or not? Like, just fuck. Yeah. The, the fact that you should threaten somebody because of, what you kill think. somebody yeah kill somebody yeah it's just um so despicable i'm against several weeks before the uprising this. the mattachine society of new york newsletter reported on the first three of these killings informing hundreds if not thousands of local sus- subscribers about the grim raping re- the quote-unquote grim reapings the same newsletter reported in April 1969 that a policeman who had shot and killed two gay men on Christopher Street docks in September 1968 was, absol- was absolved of wrongdoing by a grand jury. So they weren't going to prosecute the police. So all of these violent episodes and countless others likely contributed to the growing sense of LGBT anger and frustration that can be found in multiple first-person accounts and oral histories of the uprising. Okay. This may help explain why the Stonewall rioters responded as they did when the police invaded their space. So, on a hot summer night in 1969, police raided the Stonewall Inn, a, a bar located in Nor- New York City's Greenwich Village. What day? I haven't I'm said sorry. the date. Brian McCartney is trying to call me right now while we're recording our podcast, and so he's going to listen to this and, and hear when he was trying to call me calling. on Facebook. And this is why I didn't answer, Brian. So, um, it was on in Greenwich Village. It yep. served as a haven for the city's gay, lesbian, and transgender community. Stonewall Inn was registered as a type of private bottle bar, which did not require a liquor license because patrons were supposed to bring their own liquor. Okay. Club attendees had to sign their names in a book upon entry to maintain the the club's false exclusivity. Right. The Genovese family, which is a crime family, bribed New York's sixth police precinct to ignore the activities occurring within the club. Did we talk about the Genovese family? We talked about Kitty Genovese. That was different. No relation. It's a different one. Okay. Without police interference, the crime family could cut costs how they saw fit. The club lacked a fire exit, running water behind the bar to wash glasses, clean toilets that didn't routinely overflow, and palatable drinks that weren't watered down beyond recognition. 
What's more, the mafia reportedly blackmailed the club's wealthier patrons who wanted to keep their sexuality a secret. Okay. Nonetheless, Stonewall Inn quickly became an important Greenwich Village institution. It was large and re- relatively cheap to enter. It welcomed drag queens who received a bitter reception at other gay bars and clubs. Huh. It was a nightly home for many runaways and homeless gay youths who panhandled or shoplifted to afford the entry fee. Poor things. And it was one of the few, if not the only, gay bar that allowed dancing. At the time... Huh. What? Most oh. of the other gay bars didn't allow dancing? Because mm-hmm. it what? Draw, it was illegal. Draw too much attention? Oh, it was homosexual acts in public. Jesus. So at the time, homosexual acts remained illegal in every state except Illinois, and the bars and restaurants could get shut down for having gay employees or serving gay patrons. Good for Illinois. Police raids on gay bars. Oh, I already said that. Um, so on June 24th, 1969. Oh. June 24th, 1969? You mean the same day that... Rich Eisen, American sports journalist, was born in Brooklyn Yep, this that is, same day? This is the Tuesday before the riots begin. Police conduct an evening raid on the Stonewall, arresting some of its employees and confiscating its stash of illegal liquor. As with many similar raids, the police targeted the bar for operating without a proper liquor license. Right. That's the reason they go that's in right. and then they do all the other stuff. So that happened. That's not an uncommon thing. Okay. But after the raid, the NYPD planned a second raid for the following Friday, which they hoped would shut the, down the bar for good. Okay. So now we're to June 27th to 28th, like that night. June 27th at night into the 28th. Okay. Well, June 27th, 1969, was the same day... Uh, that convicted murderer Winnie Ruth Judd, known as the Tiger Woman, mm-hmm. for the gruesome 1931 killing of two women friends, was arrested after almost seven years as a fugitive. Judd, oh. now 64 years old, had been working as a housekeeper under the alias Marion Lane. Well, I got to do that story Ori- in the 30s. Yeah, you have to remember this one. Originally sentenced to hanging, Judd was determined after a conviction to be insane and was transferred to a mental institution, the Arizona State Hospital in Phoenix, before the execution could be carried out. From 1939 to 1962, she escaped several times. Wow. The last sentence being on October 8th, 1962, and Judd would be released two years later at the age of 66 and would pass away in 1998 at the age of 93. I feel like I've heard her name before. Yeah, so that's one for the 30s when we get yep. there. So this in, is this so, the year 2071. So this was after midnight. Yep. And it was unseasonably hot Friday night. Okay. The Stonewall was packed. And well, eight it's a Friday in late June. It should be hot anyway, right? Yeah. When eight plainclothes or undercover police officers, where six men and two women, entered the bar. In addition to the bar's employees, they also singled out drag queens and other cross-dressing patrons for arrest. Jeez. In New York City, masquerading as a member of the opposite sex was a crime. That's what they called it. First. More NYPD officers arrived on foot and in three patrol cars. Meanwhile, bar patrons who had been released joined the crowds of onlookers that were forming outside the Stonewall. A paddy wagon arrived, and police began loading Stonewall employees and cross-dressers, quote-unquote, uh. inside. So now it's the early hours of June 28th. And okay. um, accounts vary over exactly what kicked off the riots, but according to witness reports, the crowd erupted after police roughed up a woman dressed in, ma- dressed in masculine attire. Some believe the woman was a lesbian activist, Stormy DeLarvery. Okay. Who had complained that her handcuffs were too tight. People started taunting the officers, yelling pigs and copper and throwing pennies at them, followed by bottles. Some in the crowd slashed the tires of the police vehicles. According to David Carter, historian and author of Stonewall, the riot that sparked the gay revolution, yeah. the hierarchy of resistance in the riots began with the homeless or street kids, those young gay men who, who viewed the Stonewall as the only safe place in their lives. Right. Two transgender women of color, Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, were said to have resisted arrest and thrown the first bottle or brick or stone or whatever it whatever was they threw at the cops, me. respectively. Although Johnson later said in a 1987 podcast interview with historian Eric Marcus that she had not arrived until the uprising was well underway. Okay. The exact breakdown of what did of who did what first remains unclear, in part because this was long before the smartphone era. Sure. Um, so and it's all just chaos. People yes. yelling and screaming. And yep. if you've seen any of this, even the recent riots and stuff that so, are on or protests, yeah. you, it's hard to tell who started what. And what's and going where, on. Yeah. So and that's when around, we have YouTube. Around general. 4 a.m., yeah. um, police retreat into the stone wall and barricade themselves inside the building. Okay. 
Um, because in, in meanwhile, the so paddy wagon, stuff. the paddy wagon, and the squad cars left to drop the prisoners off at the sixth precinct. Oh, so they're gone. So they, the growing mob forces, the original raiding party, the ones that were that were there yeah. f- at first, into the Stonewall, Back and, into and they barricade and themselves, they barricade themselves in, so in to keep more. So the some crowd. rioters used a parking meter as a battering ram to break through the door. Others oh, threw man. beer bottles, trash, and other objects, or made impromptu fire bombs with bottles, matches, and lighter fluid. Yeah. Sirens announced the arrival of more police officers as well as squadrons of the Tactical Patrol Force, the city's riot police. As the helmeted officers marched in formation down Christopher Street, protesters outsmarted them by running away, then circling the short blocks of the village and coming back up behind the officers. Whoa. Finally, some, sometime after 4 a.m., things settled down. Amazingly, no one died or was critically injured on the first night of rioting, though a few p- police officers reported injuries. So then... Um, on June 28th to June 29th, like the next day, yeah. Stonewall reopens. Despite having been torn apart by cops, the Stonewall Inn opened before dark the next night, though it wasn't serving alcohol. Okay. More and more supporters showed up, chanting slogans like, Gay Power and We Shall Overcome. Good. Again, the police were called out to restore order, including an even larger group of TPF officers who beat and tear-gassed members of the crowd. This continued until the early hours of the morning when the crowd dispersed. TPF stands for... I said it already, but... T... Uh, the Tactical Police Force. Tactical Police Force. So over the next several nights, gay activists continued to gather near the Stonewall, taking advantage of the moment to spread information and build the community that would fuel the growth of the gay rights movement. Though police officers also returned, the mood was less confrontational, with isolated skirmishes replacing the large-scale riots of the weekend. Then on July 2nd, 1969... Oh, July 2nd, July 2nd, 1969, a Wednesday, the same day that the newest and largest casino and resort in Las Vegas, the International Hotel, opened to guests, renowned singer Barbara Streisand performed the first concert Yes. Uh, in Nevada. Yes. That same day? Mm-hmm. Um. There was the same day that Iron Mike DiBiase, forty-five-year-old American professional wrestler, died of a heart attack during a match. Ted DiBiase's dad, million-dollar man. So, in response to the Village Voices coverage of the riots, yeah, which referred to quote the forces of faggotry, <sighs> protesters swarmed outside the paper's offices. Uh-huh. Some called for burning the building down. When the police pushed back, rioting started again, but lasted only a short time, concluding by midnight. The New York Daily News also resorted to homophobic slurs in its detailed coverage, running the headline, Homo Nest Raided, Queen Bees Are Stinging Mad. Meanwhile, the New York Times wrote only sparingly of the whole event, printing a short article on page 22 on June 30th titled, Police Again Rout Village Youths. Now, the Queen Bees Are Stinging Mad. I kind of like that. Like, that doesn't seem disparaging as much. It kind of dismisses their feelings as a joke. Oh, I guess it does. But it's like, I could see that being like a... Like a celebratory. You could see them own like, it. If yo, they could we're own stinging. It. Or not stinging mad, but they should be stinging. I don't know. Maybe if they were triumphant and they destroyed everything. The queen bee stung. I don't know. But still, it's it's crazy to me that, I don't know, that it, it reignites, like the paper reignites everything. Like people have to wait to the paper. Because yeah. like nowadays, everything's instant. Right. There, it takes a couple of days yeah. to hear about it. So, um, with Stonewall, the spirit of 60s rebellion spread to LGBT people in New York and beyond, who for the first time found themselves part of a community. Oh, good. Though the gay well, it's r- kind of formed a community, this horrible stuff. Mm-hmm. Though the gay rights movement Unified didn't people. begin at Stonewall, the uprising did mark a turning point, mm-hmm. as earlier homophile organizations like the Mattachine Society gave way to more radical groups like the Gay Liberation Front and Gay Activists Alliance. When you say Mattachine, how do you, how do you spell that? M-A-T-T-A-C-H-I-N-E. Oh, Mattachine, just like I was picturing. Like machine with But not like Charlie term. Sheen. So, and the violence didn't end with Stonewall. On March 8th, 1970, for example. March 8th, 1970, the same day that, insert (laughs) stupid thing here. March 8th, 1970, the same day that American-born pro football kicker Jason Elam was born in Fort Walton Beach, Florida, and the same day that a team of assassins in Nicosia attempted to assassinate Makarios III, the president of Cyprus, 
uh, riddling the presidential helicopter with machine gun fire as it was lifting off from the rooftop of his residence, Nicosia Palace, that same day? More than 200 protesters gathered in Los Angeles to mark the anniversary of Eflin's death, the first man that I told you about got murdered. Yeah. The crowd, estimated to include more than 50 African Americans, was horrified to learn about the latest victim of state violence. Local police had killed Larry Laverne Turner, a 20-year-old African-American trans sex worker, earlier that day. Uh. On the first anniversary of the police raid on the Stonewall Inn, gay activists in New York organized the Christopher Street Liberation March to cap off the city's first gay pride week. Good. And several, several hundred people began marching up 6th Avenue towards Central Park. Supporters from the crowd joined them. The procession eventually stretched some 50 city blocks, encompassing thousands of people. Can you imagine how cool and awesome that must have felt? Like yeah, for them. For a spontaneous type parade yeah. like that. And So then, inspired by New York's example, activists in other cities, including Los Angeles, San Francisco, Boston, and Chicago, organized gay pride celebrations that same year. The frenzy yeah. of activism born on the first night at Stonewall would eventually fuel gay rights movements in Canada, Britain, France, Germany, Australia, and New Zealand, among other countries, becoming a lasting force that would carry on for the next half century and beyond. That's why June is Pride Month. That's right. That's right. Yep. And so that, that is right. That's the story. Oh, except in Charlotte when it's August for some reason. <laughs> I know. <laughs> there's a whole reason. There's a podcast I listen to about that, why it's different here. But um, anyway. Yes. So that is. It, this that was Pride, really good. Pride Month is a good time to visit oh, and that it's, history. It's June right now. Oh, no, it's July. We missed it. Oh. We did miss it, darn it. We did miss it. We were trying to get it. If we hadn't skipped a couple of weeks, we would yeah. have missed it. But anyway, that's, that's why Pride Month was June. And I've always wondered a little bit about that. Yeah. You know, I've heard of the Stonewall riots, but I didn't know a whole lot about it. Yeah. And now I know. So you've educated me. And there was no rape. Yeah. That we know of. That we know <laughs> that we know of. But this one was more of a, a tragic one, but also, also uh, from all this, from this riots and the violence and the hatred people came together and it, and mm-hmm. changed things. And mm-hmm. if you look at now, like if those people saw what was going on today, mm-hmm. they would be shocked at all the gay pride and everything and all the mm-hmm. acceptance. They'd be so upset, the hateful people anyway. But the gay folks who are the victims, I think would be p- proud and excited that this is a world that's more, it's going to got a long way to go, but it's way more accepting than it yeah, was. It's better than it was. That's so it, it, in a weird way, it gives me a little bit of hope for what what's going on now and everything yeah that this will make changes it's hard it's sad while you're dealing with it but it, it's got to be done for the better that's I know. how the human race works well in a riot way. shocks the, it's it's supposed to shock the system of society it's like throwing shock in a pool you have to do it you can i mean p- peaceful protesting only goes so far yep well, thank you for that, and we'll just finish up April, and okay. we'll be done, right? Yeah, probably. I'm probably. probably going to do another one. Um, so th- I've April. So we started this April seventh, even though it was seventeenth. But on April seventh, the United States Supreme Court ruled in Stanley versus Georgia mm-hmm. that the possession of obscene material was protected by the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Oh. Writing for the majority, Justice Thurgood Marshall commented that a state has no business telling a man sitting alone in his house what books he may read or what films he may watch. Good. Adding that individual state governments remain free to restrict public distrib- distribution of those materials, though. Yeah. So, yeah. So. Like the library can't have hardcore so section. Thurgood Marshall loved porn. Yeah. <laughs> That's what we're That's saying. That's what we're. Concluding. That's what we're surmising. Yeah. And then Tuesday, April 8th, 1969, the Montreal Expos defeated the New York Mets 11 to 10 in what sports writer Dick Young described as the first international major league baseball game in history. The Expos won of four new major league teams and MLB's, MLB's first team outside the U.S. played the Mets at New York Shea Stadium and Montreal Mayor Jean Drapeau tossed out the ceremonial first pitch. All right. How about that? Yep. Uh, and then on Wednesday, April 9th, 1969, Harvard University's administration building was seized by close to 300 students, mostly members of the Students for a Democratic Society. Shortly after midnight, the Harvard administrators called the Cambridge Police and the Massachusetts State Police and law enforcement officers charged in with billy clubs and pepper spray, arresting 184 people and injuring 45. Among those arrested was future Fox News journalist 
Chris Wallace. Oh, wow. Who used his one phone call to contact the campus radio station, which recorded a firsthand account filed from behind bars. Hmm. And that started his career. Yeah, and then now he's a big Fox News right wing nut. I think he's the one that. He's the one that is more normal. Yeah. Like, actually questions them, but he's still I was yeah. full of a lot of propaganda. Um, and then on Friday, April 11th, 1969, mm-hmm. the Seattle Pilots were a Major League Baseball team that only lasted one year, 1969. After oh. a last minute rush to install as many seats as they could in the new right field bleachers at Six Stadium. The opening day at the stadium happened on Friday, April 11, 1969. Lou Matlin, excuse me, head of stadium operation for the pilots, said, Work here shouldn't have been started a month earlier. Work here should have been started a month earlier. That's all. But things are going well now, and we're going to be ready. The seat installation went on day and night, and so did work on the roof and the grandstand. The first test of the designated hitter. I don't know what you're talking about. By and baseball way. was that same. So they had an expansion team that mm-hmm. year with the Expos yeah. from Montreal where a new, an expansion team was they add teams to the league, right? Mm-hmm. So Seattle got a team, but they weren't ready. And so they called this team the Seattle Pilots. And they the stadium wasn't built or ready, and they had to like install seats like the night before the game. It wasn't even ready for enough seats. And it was all a disaster and terrible and they only played one year, and it was shitty, and nobody came, I guess. Or, or mm-hmm. It was hard to do. And so they ended up moving to, what did that team become? Oh, Brewers. They became the Milwaukee Brewers. Okay. So they they played their home games at Sixth Stadium, and I was talking about. But on April 1st, 1970, the franchise moved to Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and became the Milwaukee Brewers. Uh, there was some thing about moving like just because of all the problems okay by the end of the season they were struggling and they didn't have any money and uh and then during the off season a car salesman former milwaukee braves minority owner bud selig offered to move the team to milwaukee so there you go i don't know why i thought the kansas city royals somebody else was it doesn't matter for them. who cares nobody cares on uh, April 12, 1969, we got a new number one song on the Billboard chart by the Fifth Dimension. Age of Aquarius. Aquarius yeah, slash good, Let, Let the, the Sunshine. sunshine. Yeah, that's the name of the song. Yeah. That's a good one. Then Saturday, April 12, 1969, Michael Jackson was born. Okay. In 1969. Gosh, that's weird. Michael D. Jackson, an American NFL wide receiver. He's only three years older than me. Oh, that's so it can't. You're not talking about Michael Jackson. Michael D. Jackson, an American oh, NFL God. wide receiver. Why'd you do that? Ha <laughs> He was killed in a motorcycle I accident in 2017. That. And then Sunday, April 13th, 1969. Yeah, I think Michael, the Michael Jackson that we know of, like, was putting out albums in the He's probably. 60s. Probably. Yeah, he? probably. Or he was Jackson 5. When was that? Yeah, I don't know. 70s? I don't know. I'm stupid. I'm a stupid idiot with a big butt and an ugly face. I think we already went through when the Jackson 5 were in the 70s, I think. Sunday, April 20th, 1969, Faux 20. A grassroots movement of Berkeley community members seized an empty lot owned by the University of California to begin the formation of People's Park. The university had demolished all buildings on the block of Berkeley, California, bounded by Telegraph, Haste, Bowditch, and Dwight Streets, leaving a vacant lot that had gone undeveloped for more than a year. So thousands of UC students and Berkeley residents, hippies and freaks and yippies and street people, and politicos and radicals and peace activists, and the Free Church of Berkeley, and environmentalists and students and grad students and professors and architects and neighbors and their children began landscaping. By May 15th, the lot would have brick paths, flowers and trees, a playground, and even an amphitheater. That's On cool. May 15th, the university would put a fence around the park and began dismantling it. Aww. And the protests and response would escalate into a riot and the calling out of 2,000 state National Guard troops. Jeez, just because yeah. they wanted a park. I know, they Why made their you own. give the hippies a park? Give the hippies a park. There was probably gay things and weed going on. Yep. They probably didn't like that. Well, it's like they say the the government decided in the 60s let's make hippies 
let's connect hippies to weed and black people to heroin and get them both out of here and because they're causing our, us too much trouble. And then fill our prisons yep, and that's make right. money off of them. That's right. Yep. That's what they did. Uh, that same day, for, its, for the first time in its 223-year history, Princeton University announced that it would now admit women to its undergraduate program, starting with 130 co-eds to begin fall semester. And they were hot. Stop it. Under the long-range plan, that was misogynistic of me to say that. Under the long-range plan, 375 more would be admitted in 1970, 550 in 1971, 630 in 1972, and guess how many in 1973? 720? No, 650, duh. Mm. Anyway, uh, <laughs> sorry. No, you're not. I'm kind of sorry. Not at all. That same day, U.S. President Nixon announced that he would order the withdrawal of 150,000 American troops from South Vietnam over the next 12 months and a gradual policy of Vietnamization, putting more responsibility on the Army of the Republic of Vietnam. And at the same time, he was expanding the bombing of North Vietnam and carried the war and into he, Cambodia. I was just going to say, he, took, he sent troops yeah, to Cambodia, Cambodia around this yeah, time, too. Right, right. Uh, Monday, April 21st, 1969, all 44 people on board an Indian Airlines flight from Agartala to Calcutta were killed as the Fokker F-27 airplane flew through several thunderstorms during its brief flight in the airspace of East Pakistan. Oh. The plane went down near the city of Kulna. I only wanted to mention that so I could say Fokker F-27. Okay. Uh, Keep your proud of yourself. April 22nd, 22nd, 1969 was a Tuesday. According to a copyrighted story in the Houston Post, Surgeon Conrad D. Moore had performed the first total transplant of an entire human eye. Ew. At Houston are, Methodist Hospital. Eyes are creepy. Eyes are creepy. That same day, John Lennon of the Beatles legally changed his name from John Winston Lennon to John Oko Lennon in honor of his new wife, Yoko Ono Lennon. Lennon told reporters, Yoko changed her name for me. I've changed mine for her. It gives us nine O's between us, which is good luck. Mm. Did you know that? Mm-mm. And then... April 23rd, 1969 was a Wednesday, six days after convicting Sirhan Sirhan of first-degree murder of assassinating Robert F. Kennedy. The same 12-person L.A. jury completed its deliberations of which deliberations of which of the two penalties to impose as a sentence, and at 11.35 in the morning announced that they had selected the death penalty. Execution in the gas chamber at California's San Quentin prison. Sirhan, who showed no emotion upon hearing the sentence, reportedly told his defense attorney, even Jesus Christ couldn't have saved me. But Sirhan, however, would be saved from execution three years later by the U.S. Supreme Court, ruling in Furman v. Georgia, finding the death penalty as written to be unconstitutional. Yeah. Yep. That same day, Oregon serial killer Jerome Jerry Brudos... We already talked about him. Kidnapped and murdered his fifth and last victim. He's a shoe fetish slayer. We talked about that guy way back. So he Remember that? killing somebody else. Uh, remember it? They all run together. He had a boob on a trophy. Oh, that guy, I remember. Yeah. The boob trophy. Yep. You think well, that's for sale somewhere? Maybe. I would love We need a doorstop for our bedroom. We need, and we would prefer one shaped like a boob. Yeah. It, it, or one that is a somebody's boob. Uh, <laughs> our daughter thinks I'm weird. Saturday, April 26, 1969, at the National Black Economic Development Conference in Detroit, militant leader James Foreman delivered what he called the Black Manifesto, encouraging African-American militants to disrupt services in white Christian churches and Jewish synagogues until the religious institutions agreed to pay $500 million in reparations for the injustices done to the black race. Yep. Everyone should pay that. It's long overdue. Oh, my God. You know they paid, in FDR paid... Um, he he gave twenty thousand dollars to every descendant of a Japanese person that had been held in an internment camp. Really? For th- and that was the internment camps last had lasted three years. So if you think about that, and and na- then you think about three hundred years of slavery. Now that we got twenty three in me, you can track everybody back to slavery. Give all those yeah. people at least. I mean, least what a million dollars? Well, not a million. Well, it's. There's not that was money. three years. The no, they sh- they should have that, but we don't have them. Yeah. I mean, you don't have enough. That's not. There's not enough money. I don't. Right. Think. But Jeff Bezos should pay all those people everything. Somebody should. And you know all the ri- anybody who makes over forty thousand dollars a year, 
Well, no. Give it up. <laughs> I don't know about that. No, anybody who makes over like four hundred thousand dollars a year, yeah. or whatever it is, that's like ridiculously wealthy. Just there, there's no just reason. there should be a limit. Just yeah. Old, you don't need. What else do you need? You're How many right. more yachts do you need? Right. Like, yeah. I don't know. I don't get it. I don't get why people want more and more and more money. Like Jeff Bezos, like, what's his goal? Right. Why do you need any more? Like, yeah. Just get, I know they give away a lot, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what they do. I don't know anything. Are we Sunday, done? Sunday, April 27, 1969, Cory Booker was born. And that brings us to Tuesday, April 29, 1969, band leader Duke Ellington was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States by U.S. President Richard Nixon at the White House in celebration of Ellington's 70th birthday. That's good. You like Duke Ellington? I think so. Yeah. I don't know anything you bad know. about him. You, know, you haven't heard any horrible stories. I haven't stories. heard any horrible stories, like Bill Cosby stories or anything. Oh, Bill Cosby forever. Oh, you know, we can't watch Fat Albert anymore. I know it. Anyway, on that note, we will end episode 117 oh, of American, American Timelines by History for Jerks. Thank you for listening. We yep. love you. Brian McCartney, I'm sorry I didn't answer your call, but I was recording this podcast. Dan Briggs, thanks for listening at at work. Ryan Burkett, thanks for listening. Ryan Burkett's listening. I love Ryan Burkett. He's a good fella. He's got a music video podcast. You should listen to that. Uh, Shannon, Shannon, Shannon Hauser's Hauser has, has been listening. listening. She's won't catch up to this one for a while. But anyway, all you people that are listening, thank you. And let us know you're listening. And we'll say your name, too, probably. Yeah. We got to get out of here, Chuck Berry. Get out of here, Chuck Berry. It's time to go. I love you. I love everybody. I apologize. We're so tired of hearing about the six days. I said, We're so tired of hearing about the six days. When you were all alone, no watchtower, a kiss in the sky. Well, I was barely a glimmer in my young daddy's eyes. I said, We're so tired. American Timelines is a member of the Queen City Podcast Network, powered by Ortho Carolina. Find out more at queencitypodcastnetwork.com. Talk about pork.